सुशील जी से है नमस्कार सुशील जी नमस्कार मारा नमस्कार नमस्कार जी जी सो वी विल गेट स्टार्टेड यस संजय यू आर गुड टू गो आई एम गुड टू गो यू कैन स्टार्ट या ऑल राइट गुड मॉर्निंग गुड आफ्टरनून गुड इवनिंग टू ऑल द the viewers for joining us from around the globe namaskar and welcome to everyone i uh, am neetu bhat secretary koa and it's my honor to um kick off this program today on behalf of our president dr archana kokru who is traveling today so just a recap for some of our viewers who might be joining us for the first time zoom the program was created by koa to connect the global community uh, global kashmiri community and discuss and debate the critical issues for wider audience and possible solutions the name itself is re- reminiscent of a program zunoda that used to run on radio kashmir and most of us grew up listening to this program in the mornings and zunoda will continue to evolve in this format and have more and we'll have more conversations about our social cultural and current affairs that are relevant to the kashmiri hindu community by the way the program zoom it up in kashmir was um, created by legendary mr pushkar ban that we are all aware of so it's my pleasure and honor to welcome today zoom it up guest who is also one of our greatest contemporary scholars who has been tirelessly working towards the kashmiri hindu rehabilitation for over last three decades so without much ado i would like to welcome shri sushil pandit ji namaskar sushil ji and welcome to the zoom dub today namaskar mara namaskar ji sushil ji needs no introduction to any indian and especially to our kashmiri community a renowned historian orator an intellectual and founder of the founder and ceo of hive communications india he shana ko so he as you all know he's been predominantly as a kashmiri leader and a firebrand activist who has voiced a strong opinion on kashmir issue and made the story of kashmiri hindus known worldwide on various platforms So, so also i would like to introduce our host and moderator mr sanjay call sanjay ji grew up in delhi and has been our zoom dub lead um, having brilliantly moderated numerous events this year so from early days in kashmir he has been passionate and active in theater and radio programming currently sanjay ji is an entrepreneur in the healthcare space and is based out of New Jersey zone 3 for KOA so Sanjay ji please take it from here it's all yours thank you thank you, thank you. namaskar once again uh, sushil ji and uh, thanks uh, neetu it's a wonderful opportunity and uh, it's a privilege really to be talking to you uh, we've all heard about uh, sushil ji on youtube and z and all the channels and uh, so it's no 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 introduction as neetu said the topic for today is simple in many ways and straightforward and the challenge will be to stay on the specifics and we'll try to uh, uh, you know uh, time and everything sunday afternoon so we will not spend too much time on the history of kashmir <coughs> and all that stuff we will stay on article 370 that is the topic and, and and we all know how important it is it is probably one of the most historical decisions that happened in our lifetime related to jnk and in many ways uh, not just for jnk for rest of india because of the proximity of the place the geopolitical history the the wars we fought with the neighboring countries and so on so it's very very critical very important we all know that this happened on august 5 2019 almost 3 years plus have passed and it seems like it just happened you know just like that uh another uh, uh fact i want to mention about this abrogation was when this was done there was also a jammu and kashmir reorganization act of 2019 that was passed in the parliament which also gave a special status to uh, as to uh, to union territories and sushilji will probably dive deeper into that uh 
uh, Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh. So those are the big sort of things that happened post abrogation. Post abrogation. We will have very few questions for you, Sushilji, but hopefully we'll take a deep dive and we'll have a time slot for Q&A because a lot of folks have joined us. They have questions and I think we want to give them a chance to ask you. Rubaru to nahi ho sakta. It's as good as uh, Rubaru in, in modern uh, day and time. So, pehla sawal, thode sankship mein, if you can talk about the overview of Article 370, how it happened, why it happened, from 1954, it started till its abrogation and you know how it affected the people of JNK and its impact. If you can just talk about that. So everybody's on the same page because many people know about it, but I think still some people need a context, if you will, of the Article 370. Please. Thank you, Sanjayji. First of all, grateful for this invitation. It's a fabulous initiative to bring the community and the larger community of Hindus together and uh, bring up the contemporary issues and other important issues in our discourse so that we remain connected to our reality. It's very easy to you know, lose ourselves in a day-to-day -day humdrum and the business of surviving and getting ahead. Article 370 is in our constitution from day one. The constitution making process stopped or culminated or concluded on November 25, 1949. On 26th of November 1949, all the members of Constituent Assembly signed off on the document as a mark of their approval and their testimony. Constitution making process had one very interesting caveat that we will never put anything in the constitution through voting. We will do it through consensus. And consensus building takes time, takes a lot of debate and argument. Article 370 was one of the last mm -hmm. provisions to be added to this constitution. Article 370 was hugely contested. The Chairman of the drafting committee in our constitution, Dr. Bhim Rao Ambedkar, he was also the first law minister of this country in Jawaharlal Nehru's interim cabinet after we got our so-called independence. Constituent assembly comprised of elected members from different parts of India. Sheikh Abdullah and three of his colleagues were part of constituent assembly. They created, helped create the constitution of India through that consensus. And towards the end, he went to Jawaharlal Nehru and asked for certain concessions and exceptions to be made for the state of Jammu and Kashmir. Jawaharlal Nehru guided him to Ambedkar, that he's the law minister, go ask for what you want and he will draft it for you. And when he went to Dr. Ambedkar and asked for what he wanted, Dr. Ambedkar rejected it ab initio. In his words, he said, you want India, rest of India, to build roads and bridges, build hospitals and schools, even defend the territory. And in return, you don't want rest of India to have anything to do in Kashmir. If I were to approve of this, I would be committing a treason with this newly independent republic. So I'm not going to do this. Jawaharlal Nehru thought that since Congress had the majority in the Constituent Assembly, if the Congress Working Committee passes this uh, with approval, then rest of the Constituent Assembly will come around the view the Congress Working Committee rejected it in one voice. Nehru, as he was committed to Sheikh uh, for all his whims and fancies, then asked Sardar Patel, his deputy prime minister and home minister, and Gopalaswami Ayanga, man without portfolio in his ministry, assisting him on Kashmir affairs. Gopalaswami Ayanga was one time the prime minister of Maharaja Hari Singh also is a very well-known civil servant bureaucrat. Both Sardar Patel and Gopal Swami Ayanga 
approached constituent assembly and persuaded them with a cock and bull story that Kashmir is a you know, contested state, it is facing an invasion and a ceasefire, the matter is in UN, we cannot treat it with the same uh, standard that rest of India uh, we have. And therefore, this is an exceptional uh, provision, which is only temporary and transient. They added these two words in the very first sentence when the provision, the article was defined and texted. With these provisions and such aggressive persuasion, the Constituent Assembly passed this to be added, but Bhim Rao Ambedkar insisted on not being a party to it. He refused to attend that session, which incorporated Article 370 in the Indian Constitution. What does Article 370 do? In all my conversations across the world, when I ask people of their understanding, the routine response is that it disallows people from rest of India to buy land in Kashmir. That is the popular notion about Article 370. As if it was a matter of real estate, which is very partially true. I mean, it's a little fraction of what it does. And if I were to tell you, Article 370 in the name of autonomy to Jammu and Kashmir restricts the jurisdiction of our parliament, the highest sovereign body. I shouldn't say restricts because it is not in present tense anymore. But when it did, Indian parliament, our highest sovereign body, with jurisdiction over every square inch of land called India had no jurisdiction over Jammu and Kashmir. So every law it passed had a caveat except in the state of Jammu and Kashmir. Then it restricted the jurisdiction of constitution of India. The same constitution which Sheikh Abdullah and his colleagues helped draft. They were party to it. So they built the constitution of India and then did not let it prevail in the state of Jammu and Kashmir. Look at the hypocrisy. Then it restricted the jurisdiction of Supreme Court of India, Election Commission of India, Comptroller and Auditor General of India. Whole lot of these restrictions, and these are sovereign bodies. You know, what else is a sovereign nation? And how else can a territory be part of it? if these organs of the state do not prevail in a territory. Wow. So why was this done? If you remember, partition of India was carried out on the premise that Muslims of India cannot live with the Hindu majority in India, even if it were a democracy, even if it were a secular democracy, even if it was a constitutional democracy where everyone was equal, Muslim League said, because Muslims are a minority, it will necessarily have to endure a Hindu majority rule. So no matter what the provisions are and privileges are for minority, we cannot live. We have been rulers. We cannot be ruled by a Hindu majority, even if a democratic dispensation. So we want a separate country. If that was the reason for partition, Exactly same were the reasons of Sheikh Abdullah for Jammu and Kashmir. We are a Muslim majority state. And we would have our own constitution. We will not have your parliament, your Supreme Court, your election commission, your controller and auditor general, and a whole lot of other provisions apply to us. So in effect, what he demanded and got was a Pakistan on the territory of India. This is what Article 370 did. It was not just a question of buying land. If land were the only issue, I would rather say that even President of India could not buy a square inch of land in Jammu and Kashmir, if he, if he so wished. Forget rest of the citizens. So this is the travesty inflicted on us on day one. Okay, okay. You mentioned 1954. That is the year when 35A was smuggled into our constitution. When I say smuggled in, 
35 capital A is a provision which is not in the main body of constitution. It is in the annexure one. And even parliament was not informed. It was behind the back of the nation, quietly through a presidential proclamation added to the annexure of constitution of India. Many jurists and judges did not know of its existence. We had 35 small A, but not capital A. And these are two different things. So what does 35 capital A does after having done all that? It entitles the state of Jammu and Kashmir to define its own citizens as different from the citizens of the country. And by doing so, and they did so through in retrospective effect from 1944, because it wanted to disenfranchise all the Hindus and Sikhs who ran away from Pakistan-occupied Kashmir and West Punjab in the wake of partition to take refuge in the state of Jammu and Kashmir. So it defined its citizens as they existed in 1944 and denied the rights to buy land, to build a house, to have a shop, any real estate, to even educate their children in state institutions, have entitlement to scholarships, jobs, even government contracts, voting rights, fighting elections, all of this was denied in the name of defining the, what they called state subjects. This is how they created two classes of citizens. And would you believe they even created a condition that those from rest of India traveling to Jammu and Kashmir would need a permit. I remember that, I remember that, yeah. As yeah. if we were going for a visa. Now, this is the travesty inflicted through Article 370. So, so that's a big context, right? I think, and all that is gone, at least 35A and 30, 370 is both gone. Is that correct to say? Yes, 35A came on 14th of June, 1954. Even the pre then president, Dr. Rajendra Prashad, asked a question, wrote a letter to Jar Pandit Nehru. Is this constitutional? Is this legal? Is this moral? Is it politically tenable? Should we even do it? Is it a national interest? And Jawaharlal Nehru, in a written reply, told him, all your questions are valid, but we will discuss it off the record. So no one knows what they discussed off the record. But this was proclaimed. Nehru prevailed. And you must understand, 1954 is the time when Sheikh was already deposed. He was deposed in July 1953, which means it wasn't tied up to Sheikh Abdullah. It was the policy of Nehru and Congress. They could not blame Sheikh Abdullah's uh, arm twisting. And all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so another so a follow-up question. So I think context is detailed enough, and we should uh, go to the next question. So but I think one more thing I want to just say before we jump to the next question. Wasn't Article 370 also, or a similar statute, was also in some other states like Sikkim, Arunachal, or some of the northeastern states? Can you just spend a couple of minutes on that, please? Yes. So very often, the apologists of Article 370 say that there is 371 also, which gives similar uh, guarantees or protections to different states. It is absolute bullshit. Article 370 restricts our parliament, restricts our constitution, restricts our courts, restricted a whole lot of things and actually defines the citizenship as independent of Indian citizenship. And But Article 371 only creates protections for certain states, which is where, which are sensitive geographies, where you need to take the permission from local authorities only there is no absolute restriction. Okay, okay. There is regulation. Okay, okay. And in that regulation, yes, there are border states, there are disturbed states yes. where poor or tribals have their own property and land holdings, and you protect them. Not marginalized, marginalized. Money bags. But if somebody has a viable and good project can go, they, they go and have those things done. And it doesn't restrict our sovereignty in the process. Okay. But, so these are completely, you know, not uh, comparables. Point taken, point taken, yeah, okay. 
So I think I wanted to clarify for myself and uh, for some of the listeners also, as you say, a lot of times this is brought out, you know, Arunachal and all that. So that's a very uh, good clarification for, you know, me also. I think let's move forward. I think context is set up. We all understand, hopefully a better understanding of how draconian and how bad this 370 was. And Another difference you must remember, all of us, those were special provisions. 370 was not a special provision. 370 was a temporary and transient provision. 370 is not temporary and transient. It is a special provision. Okay. Got it, got it, we are got in a different it. chapter of constitution. So those who are into legal fineries would appreciate the difference. Okay, okay. So I think I'm going to move forward post abrogation, and I want to uh, talk about a little bit positive on after 370. What would you say if I was to ask you to list or to talk about three things? that have happened after 370 that could be considered a positive for the rest of the country and JNK and people and minorities and Shias. And I know there is a lot you can uh, talk in that, but let's say the, the three positive things that I would say that could have. Emotionally, there is a lot of positive stuff I know, but if you could just talk about that. Okay, so before I get down to the positives, one of the biggest positive you can draw your own inference from is the fact that on 5th of August 2019, when our parliament decided to do away with most of these provisions of Article 370 and neutered it literally, technically it still exists in our constitution because to remove this article, there are some legal issues. So you retain it, but you completely dysfunctionalize it. And that's what we did. We neutered it. Now, what happened when we neutered it? On 6th of August, Pakistan called our High Commissioner because we, our ambassadors in some Commonwealth countries are called High Commissioners. Yes, yes, yes. This is Ajay Bisaria. Called him and told him, you are persona non grata, pack your bags. On 7th, the very next day, they called him again and they said, sorry, we want to humiliate you more. You are expelled and you have only 24 hours. Pack your bags and leave. I don't recall in the last 40, 50 years, we have ever expelled a Pakistani diplomat in the sense of Pakistan High Commissioner, an ambassador from India. Despite provocations like Kargil war, attack on our parliament, Mumbai attacks, even Pulwama or Uri or other atrocious things. Never happened. Have, Kandahar hijacking. Never happened. The hijackers as well as the, <clears throat> the terrorist release were given civil receptions in Pakistan. None of these occasions India resorted to this. And when Indian parliament using its jurisdiction on Indian constitution in an open session through debate in a due process addresses an issue in our, our constitution, what business Pakistan has doing this? Point taken, point taken, sir. So you know whose interests Pakistan was serving. Uh, Article 370 was serving in our constitution. Not just this. China, on 13th of August, went to Security Council of United Nations and sought the other P4, permanent four, to discuss this issue. The other P4 said, nothing doing. This doesn't belong here in our agenda. It is internal matter of India. That did not deter China. They went to Security Council twice more before August of, before December of 2019. So the same five months, they went to Security Council thrice. I don't recall India having gone to Security Council even once in the last 70 years. For all the stuff China has done, but I got it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so you know how China suffered on this count. Now, Come back. If India reclaims sovereignty over its territory. For me, it is far more than any tangible benefits in my pocket or any, any individual's pocket. What it certainly did was, and to me, that was a big plus because Indian political class, Indian leadership, Indian system, across the board, all parties, coalitions, prime ministers, governments put together had a consensus to retain Article 370 and they retained them. 
governments came and went, but it remained. For the first time, I thought Indian state had realized that this was a challenge to their existence. It was an existential threat and they need to repeal it. And I thought for the first time, India has decided to now declare a war on jihad instead of to continue to appease it. And in that, I thought there was redemption because we were waiting for the Indian state to eventually call the bluff and join the battle of survival instead of appeasing and uh, aggrandizing and trying to win hearts and minds of an implacable enemy, they would now start fighting back to save itself. Okay. This was the biggest plus. I've mm -hmm. asked many Bhattas, many Kashmiri Hindus, I mean, what makes you happy about Article 370 neutered? They said, and this has been repeated refrain, hey, Yes, yes, yes. Whether I get anything or not, thank you. That become the symbol yes. of the enemy within, and this yes. enemy within has been dismantled. It yes. is a matter of satisfaction that our leadership has finally found spine, yes, found the political will, which was missing. Agreed. 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 At the ground level, you know, there is a PM's package, and some things have happened. And some things have not enough change, but would you would you would you like to talk, talk about those things that yes. have happened in a uh, yeah? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Now all that is not related to 370 at all. All this predates the neutering of Article 370. For example, PM's package was thought about in 2010, started implementing in 11, 12, and under that some jobs were given to Kashmiri youth in order to push them back in the valley. And I, for one, wasn't an enthusiastic supporter of it because, you see, when we left Kashmir, we had our jobs, we had our businesses, we had our homes and lands, didn't we? We left all that because we could not live anymore safely. Our mothers, daughters, sisters could not live there without being humiliated. That was the reason we had to leave. Absolutely. We had our jobs. Absolutely. Now throwing jobs at us and throwing some camp accommodations at us, they're wanting to drag us back. We had our big homes, not barbed wire camps. We yet left because things were untenable. And have you made things tenable? Is security available? If it is not available, if those conditions still prevail, why are you forcing us back in the valley? To what purpose? And why aren't you fighting those forces and demolishing them before you want to push us back? And my understanding is it is only to rid themselves of this blame that you've not been able to put Kashmiris back in Kashmir. Just to, you know, nakhwalum in, in Kashmiri, you say, you need to just get rid of this monkey on your back that you've not been able to rehabilitate Kashmiri Hindus on their lands that you want to push us back. And you want to tell the world that, see, we have given thousands of jobs. We have created some dozens of camps where we keep them like you know, zoo animals. We give them protection, but they are back. And now whoever had to go back has gone back. Those who don't want to go back, we can't force them. Matter over. This has so, been. I think, yeah, I, I got your point. So <clears throat> let's change uh, on that a little bit. I didn't want to interrupt you. Uh, NRI community, NRI Indian community, or Indians in India, I think for NRIs, it's harder sometimes to do anything on the ground because we are far. There is a lot of emotional you know, zeal or thing to do, but what can we do? Maybe keep the discussion alive, keep the conversation alive. That's part of it, right? So we are doing that. The colleges sometimes in this country or universities have a very different perspective story on Kashmir and their version is definitely totally, in my view, incorrect. And, and there are reasons for that. And I, th I think we have discussed those. But are there any things we can do from here, not just the Kashmiri Hindus, the Indian community that can make things better? Can we influence congressmen? I think there is some activity that has been done by KO in that regard also. Uh, Indians in India, of course, can do a lot more, but if you can just uh, touch on those points, uh, some of the things that come to your mind, 
Now, Sanjay Ji, this was uh, this is a very very uh, apt uh, issue. This government, Modi government, has been found to be most sensitive to NRI moods and NRI approvals ever. You know, no other government in India has invested so much in NRI engagement, Indians abroad, Indian diaspora abroad, as this government has, and showcased it uh, to the world that how popular uh, this government is, and also to Indians in India as to how successful, knowledgeable, committed Indians hail this government and its achievements and become ambassadors of this government's great work across the world. So therefore, the clout you wield over this government and its policies is disproportionately large. Mm -hmm. You may not be voting in the elections for them to you know, retain their office. But for the optics, for the legitimacy, they really rely a great deal on you. States tensions in the region have been high since U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited. We I have think a... somebody's TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, so not more, not really to engage congressmen and senators where you are, or parliamentarians or bureaucracy wherever you are. If you create a standard for the government to meet, if you actually start asking questions, what have you done about this, that, and the other, on policy, on commitments, the government, because of its sensitivity to your perception of the government, will be forced to do something substantive and not just do window dressing or do symbolism uh, in order to get away on a certain issue. Now, what kind of symbolism prevails? In order to build an illusion of security, what you do, what you find happening in Kashmir is event management. On 15th of August, you will find hundreds of tricolors atop shikaras, some buildings. You will find children singing Janagana Mana and uh, some parade happening. And you will say, see, Kashmir has changed. Or on Janamashtami, you will have a video clip of a procession from Lal Chowk, you know, decked up Radha Krishna, and you know, you will have bhajans and singing and dancing devotees in a procession. And you say, did you ever imagine this happening at Lal Chowk? Now, this kind of event management, headline management, and suggestion of normalcy is so superficial that it takes jihad just one week of killing every day to bring these illusions crashing down. And nowhere are people safe, whether in their homes, sitting in their offices, working in their banks, managing their shops, on the streets, no place absolutely is safe for them. So, so you're saying the, the NRI community should engage the present government more actively through various uh, channels? Yeah. yeah. And, and then there is this, uh, this pulling of wool over our eyes. On 5th of August, you proclaim that 370 has been undone. And on 31st of March, 2020, within less than eight months, you surreptitiously slip in a domicile notification, 45 page legal document which says those who have been staying in Kashmir for 15 years continuously are entitled to be called the permanent citizens or the domiciled citizens of Kashmir. And only such citizens will have a monopoly on all jobs. Now, after keeping Kashmir in a citadel-like provision 370, which prevented rest of Indians to go there, you have just about created a level playing field. There is a huge job of correcting the demographic imbalance, building back, bringing back those who were expelled from Kashmir just because they were Hindus or Sikhs. You create that 15 year tall wall to re-privilege that majority in Kashmir. Why did you have to do it? 
Who are you trying to appease? Who had asked for it? These questions have to be asked. Who will go to Kashmir now? How, and today you have created a mechanism that there is one privilege that they will have a monopoly over all jobs. What is the guarantee that subsequent governments or administrations may not add to those privileges like you will only have, uh, only these people have the claim on scholarships or government contracts and buying of agriculture land or buying of houses or any, any other thing, even voting and contesting elections, we'll be back to square one because you created a legitimate device in the system called domicile citizens by none other than the home ministry in the central government. So, you know, in competitive populism, you can keep piling up these privileges in the name of mandate we have received from the people of Kashmir. So this was treachery, nothing short of that. And somebody must hold this government to account as to what was the need and who were they trying to appease. Ekor, Ekor, uh, I mean, I was reading about this. Uh, uh, there was a G20 talk uh, being uh, held and they were saying they might want to organize this in Kashmir. And that kind of brings a, so that is just a sham or, but I think in general, if there is a national event of some stature, whether it is hockey or cricket or football, which, is, which has got central government money, and in building roads and infrastructure and not given to the state government at all for disbursements and all that. Do you think those kind of activities can sort of make things change there? If there is a national event held, security has to be there. Government will be liable if something wrong happens, not just some Kashmiri Hindu boys, you know, getting a job there. Would that not change the mix if there is a national event held, which is, you know, literary conference, anything which has other Indians going there, not just Kashmiri Hindus, you know? Sanjayji, you know, we are given to symbolism more than <laughs> substantive stuff. This is part of symbolism. This is part of window dressing. If you remember in 1983, when India had just won the World Cup cricket under Kapil Dev's leadership, there was a West Indies tour of India and a match was played in Srinagar. I was there. And you know what happened? Yes, I was there. Yes, yes. Okay. Four years back, I happened to meet Sunil Gavaskar over breakfast and we spoke and I reminded him of that match. You know what he said? He said all West Indies players were amazed because the kind of support they get in at home is, was not as vociferous as they got in Srinagar, number one. And number two, they said, uh, I could have understood West Indies flags fluttering in some hands, but they were Pakistani flags that is while true. we were playing India. And Gavaskar said, that day, I promised myself that I will never ever set foot in Kashmir. And I have held on to that promise till date. You know, when, I know, I know. Those, are, those are real things and I'm not, I'm not trying to... Point is, this is G20 summit is not going to happen in Kashmir. One of the retreats destination in Kashmir uh, is Kashmir. So G20 summit will happen in Delhi, but a plane load of you know, officials and uh, heads of the state will be taken there just as, just as we take plane loads of smuggled in European parliament members. We took them in October 2019. Then we took several envoys, foreign envoys stationed in Delhi in two plane loads to seek their approval to show them that everything is normal. I mean, on one hand, we say that we don't need international meddling or certification of how Kashmir is uh, handled by India, whether it is stable or normal or abnormal. On the other hand, we seek their indulgence and seek approval and validation from no, them no, no, every now and then. It shows how shaky or how, uh, how superficial we are on this issue of uh, this being our internal issue. Then why do we need to resort to such symbolism? Sure, sure, sure. I know, no, my point was different, but just one thing, my audience please post in the chat groups. We are almost at a point where we will take the questions. 
Um, so please uh, post any questions and our team will curate them and you know uh, we'll ask them as much time permits. But point was not for uh, coming back to your uh, response, Sushilji. My point was not for the show off, showing off to the world. I was more thinking whenever uh, Asian Games in Delhi, right? When it happened, the infrastructure of the city really got improved. So government finds an opportunity to spend money without too many questions asked and actually things do get done and political parties get benefit and all that, but actually something gets built. In that sense, if there was a meet in Kashmir, probably it could get closer to the rest of the country. I was just thinking on those lines, which may not be the time for today, you know. Sanjay ji, Kashmir needs sanitized atmosphere, sanitized of jihad, sanitized of insurgency, sanitized of AK-47s. Indian state has seized more than 100,000 Kalashnikovs in Kashmir. Kalashnikovs are neither manufactured in India, nor they grow on the apple trees of Kashmir. If there is so much of arms and ammunition in Kashmir, and you hang upside down to just about pull off an event incident free, does it mean that you have normalized the situation? You, no, may no. Perhaps, you may perhaps create an antiseptic network of security in the footprint where G20 guys are landing for a week or two days or four days. And after they leave, it is back to square one. What good it is for Kashmir or for India, except for the symbolism that, see, we did this. So point is, we have to do something permanent on the ground. And as far as infrastructure is concerned, let us not reward violence and jihad with infrastructure and development. It doesn't impress them at all. Gilani had said it from the rooftops when Prime Minister announced an 80,000 crore package in 2014. He said, even if you pave our roads with gold, we are not going to leave our insistence for freedom. That is the attitude and that needs to be addressed first. This is instead of stick giving carrot, this is incentivizing jihad, this is incentivizing violence, it is incentivizing bad behavior. This place needs sanity more than infrastructure. Okay, I think some questions are coming. So uh, uh, let's see, uh, at least one question I think I can take. Sharda Jine uh, question ek beja hai, Sharda Chervu. I mean, it could be a long question. So if you, <laughs> it could be long. You know. So the question has a very large uh, response option, I think. But if you can just uh, keep it a little bit shorter. The question is, what are some of the things, three things that, in your opinion, is just not plain symbolism? Though I feel some symbolism is always necessary, not only, but anyway, so that's a different discussion. So she's asking, uh, what are the three things that are not just symbolism and not just window dressing, that can make a sustainable impact. So if, okay. if we can keep it short, I know it's a, it could mean a very long, yeah. No, the problem is there is even symbolism in fighting back with jihad. I'll tell you, on 5th of February, 2019, and this is almost nine days before Pulwama happened, okay? They banned JKLF and they detained Yasin Malik. And what they said while doing so is that JKLF was responsible for the Kashmiri Hindu genocide. They wrote, gave it in writing. Rajiv Goba was the home secretary. He addressed the press conference himself. Now imagine JKLF was responsible for our genocide in 1990 and 1989. Yes. And they banned it in 2019, 5th February, just two months before general elections. This is what I call misplaced symbolism. They banned Jamaat-e-Islami, but they didn't let their institutions go under lock. They didn't ban their youth wing, jamiyat e tulba to be banned. They didn't ban ahl hadith which is widely acknowledged globally as the mother of, uh, mother of lashkar e Tayyaba. They did not ban a whole lot of incendiary mosques from where propaganda happened. They did not detain Malvis. They did not do a whole lot of things. Just so banning banning these organization is one thing. Complete ban or you know that is one thing that two, I'm hearing. Two, two. I'm I'm talking about symbolism. Now they say that we are prosecuting Yasin Malik. We have put him in life life imprisonment. You know what he has been prosecuted for? 
He's been prosecuted for money laundering. He's been prosecuted for terror funding. He's been prosecuted for belonging to an organization that waged war against India. Now, some of these are white collar crimes. He has not been prosecuted for massacres, for murders, for abductions, for rapes, for genocide, which would have given him capital punishment. And the sham was exposed the moment he readily accepted all those charges and there was no argument, there was no trial literally, and the court convicted him and sentenced him to life imprisonment as if it was a stage managed scripted drama, which started and ended within weeks. This is what I call symbolism. You are unwilling to prosecute those who are soaked in our blood. It was state's job to prosecute Bitta Karate. Would you believe it is Satish Tiku's family who's prosecuting him and the state is dragging its feet? This is where they get exposed. Not one heinous crime till date in the last 33 years has been prosecuted, convicted or sentenced. Not one as an exception. Okay, okay so this is one area, okay. Uh, that is non-symbolism that can be done much differently and, and much more effectively and much more honestly, if you will, that should be done. Okay, any other uh, uh, non-symbolic activity? I'm, I'm referring to Sharda. Yes, yes, yes. I, 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 I will come to now issues that directly, I mean, this, not that these issues do not directly impinge on us. They have till date not acknowledged our genocide. They still call us migrants. They still call what happened in Kashmir was separatism, was some kind of uh, brainwashing of the youth, was uh, you know uh, some misunderstanding between communities, which now needs to be restored into some mythical utopian era of harmony, milk and honey. This is what is being said. That's also wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I must. I we all must insist that please acknowledge our genocide. This was nothing short of a genocide. It met with the conditions of UN Convention on Genocide 1948. You must acknowledge our genocide. That's number one. Number two, you must deliver justice to victims and survivors. Thirty-three years is a long time. It is a shame for any criminal justice system to not even look at it. Even Supreme Court tossed away our petition in 2017, saying it is too late. 27 years have passed. This is utter crying shame. Chief Justice J.S. Kehar and Chief Justice Deepak Mishra themselves were complicit in this. With the bench of Justice Chandrachur, they even tossed away our review petition. So this is horrendous. Three, our properties have been encroached our homes, our lands have been grabbed, either in distress sale or they just simply walked in and occupied. That should be, yeah, yeah, okay. So, and, you know, San Sanjayji, uh, let me just spend two more sentences on this. So long as ill-gotten profits of our genocide continue in the hands of these highway robbers, there will always be an incentive in future to commit this genocide again, because it is profitable. You have to snatch away at least the immovable gains that they have made of lands, of homes, of temple properties, of orchards, of businesses, of shops, that has to be taken away. Okay, that's very specific. Okay, I got it. I think Sharda, you must have got the answer, yeah, yeah. And fourth, fourth, we cannot live in the same homes where our neighbors betrayed us to our killers. Let this be very clear. We need our share of the valley. We need Panun Kashmir. We will rebuild it. We will secure it. But government must show the spine to bring us back to a place from where we will never ever be driven out again. We have had enough of it. We cannot go back as sitting ducks, as lambs to slaughter, to be chased out again a couple of generations down the line. So, so I think just to summarize, I think this is these are really great ideas. Acknowledging genocide, uh, banning, uh, uh, you know, the, the the sorry, the punishment for the 
uh, for the perpetrators and of crime. Heinous crimes, yes. Crimes. Tribunals, special yeah. tribunals for that. And you, you know, a genocide legislation has been proposed because these were no ordinary crimes. These are no peace peacetime crimes like, you know, a, a stray murder or a stray robbery. No. This was organized, and yes, institutionalized. Yes. This needs a Nuremberg-like trial. This needs Tokyo-like trial. And third, in, in, important profit. In our constitution, in our criminal justice system. Yeah, I think these are definitely all three are very valid points. And I see that would put, like you said, precedence to anybody ever attempting to do this to any minority, not just Kashmiri Hindu minority. And it could be taken in, in India. There's a lot of injustice happening to many minorities. Such things should be for, as a country, any minority should be protected for that matter. Okay. Now, I think we're almost, uh, I think we have done very well with the time. So I'm very happy that we've been able to, uh, you know, do this in under an hour. But one thing I want you before we wrap up and ask Neetu to thank. You know, uh, last time we met, you had talked about a Hindu global uh, uh, summit or a conference that something is like planned in 2023. I think some of us are aware of it, but a lot of other folks who are today joining from all over the world, if you can just talk about that and just in a brief, what it is all about, what it entails and so on. Thank you so much for bringing this up, Sanjayji. I'm grateful for this. We have on every 19th of January, congregated in small or big numbers wherever we are to remind ourselves and remind others as to what happened to us in 1990 in Kashmir. This year, idea is to scale it up. And this year, idea is to tweak this narrative a little. We've always called it the Kashmiri Hindu genocide. I believe, and a lot of my... There's an audio issue, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We cannot hear Sushilji. Still cannot hear. I think he's on mute. Do you on? Yeah. Yes. Ah, somebody muted me. Okay. So the idea is, idea is that this is not a standalone Kashmiri Hindu genocide. In fact, it is continuation of Hindu genocide that has been taking place over the last more than a thousand years. There was a genocide of Hindus in Sindh. There is a complete wipeout of Hindu population from Afghanistan. There is a wipeout of Hindu population from Punjab, Balochistan, and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. There is a wipeout of Hindu Sikh population from Pakistan occupied Kashmir, Gilgit, Baltistan, Skartu. Hindu population in Bangladesh is staring at a collapse with under 8% proportion of population. It used to be 31% in 1951 census of East Pakistan. There was a huge assault on Hindus of Sri Lanka in 2009. There's a huge discrimination against Hindus of Malaysia, institutionalized discrimination through Bhumiputra policies. Yes, I know that. Hindus were expelled from East Africa from Kenya, from Tanzania, from uh, Uganda. Uh, and they had to take refuge all over the world. Hindus were replacement for the slaves who were freed through a euphemism called indentured labor. And they were striven all over like Mauritius, Mauritius. Trinidad, Egypt, Egypt. South Africa. So Hindus, not just in medieval times through jihad, of Tatars and Turks and Persians and Uzbeks suffering it in the mainland India, Hindus all over the world have been at the receiving end and hundreds of million lives have been lost. Territories have been cleansed of Hindus and what happened in medieval times in India happened in 1990 in this day and age in Kashmir. And it is continuing in several other parts of India, in Bengal, in Bihar, in Malapuram, Kerala, Kerala, in Uttar Pradesh, in Tamil Nadu, we are being oppressed in our own free country. So this must go up. This <clears throat> battle of narratives has to be fought in right earnest globally. So what we are going to do this 19th of January is project Kashmiri Hindu genocide as part of continuing Hindu genocide for over a millennium. Awesome. And this will go from each corner of the world 
say in east most sydney in sydney. australia to singapore to bangalore to mumbai to delhi to dubai to brussels to london to east coast in us say in in washington dc or new york to toronto to dallas to san francisco west coast where it will culminate and we will have communities locally so that they don't have to fly long distances all over the world congregate in one big marathon conference where a baton will be passed from one city to the other through a digital connect a digital spine and each venue will have giant screens to see what is happening on the other venues so a 20 hour vigil across the world addressed by the tallest and the most visible icons global icons we are trying to get steven spielberg at the west coast awesome. who has who's built who's who's made uh, schindler's list and who himself as a community is part of a genocide that happened we'll try and get former prime ministers you know david cameron in uk probably steven harper in toronto canada who's the current leader of opposition we'll try and get uh, tony abbott or former prime minister or scott morrison till recently the prime minister in australia we will try and get credible voices those who stand with the victims and call for an end to this 1 billion hindus will come together across regions languages um, states ethnicities as one community in order to highlight this issue and tell the world enough of it no more and needless to say we are with you and the akoa is also going to be supporting and helping and whatever we can and we'll talk about that so i think uh, uh, we are almost at the end of it so thank you very much sushil ji and thank you the audience for the audience uh, for you know making this program uh, on a sunday afternoon sharing your sunday afternoon with us it's everybody has a busy schedule i know and still summer in most of united states so people have a lot of plans i really appreciate everybody joining and uh, before we end i last need to uh, to on the on behalf of koa to take over and thank uh, everybody please need to go ahead thank you sanjay thank you for a brilliant conversation that we had here and as much as we would like this interesting conversation in which we are personally vested to continue everything good has to come to an end and sushil ji when you talk you hold the cap audience captive you have done an extensive work and today we have just touched the tip of the iceberg so thank you for being a voice and representing us on different forums um i would like to uh, extend uh, thank you to our audience as you said sanjay on the sunday afternoon summer su sunday afternoon they joined us so thank you so much and last but not the least indu for all that you do and sanjay ji for always carrying the program so brilliantly thank you all of you and thank you sushil ji for joining us i'm so grateful it's a great honor and privilege to be part of this vibrant community um and to be part of this conversation with sanjay ji he's put in a lot of heart and soul in building up this platform i wish you absolutely all for your future endeavors thank you so much thank you thank you sushil ji for your time thanks sir